Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, we'll have our first international keynote address, and this will be on uh, the penetrating cardiac box injuries in the stable patient, sternotomy or drainage alone. Dr. Felipe Vega, who you've been seeing up here on the podium and introducing people, uh, will be on the pro side, or the sternotomy side? No. The sternotomy side, and Dr. Chad Ball will be on the drainage alone side. So it's a pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Vega, who I've got to know over the telephone and internet, and finally now in person, and uh, it's wonderful to have a new friend in Mexico. He's a graduate from, uh, in, uh, at the Mexico School of Medicine at La Salle University, did his postgraduate surgery at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, and went on to do trauma uh, surgery fellowship, both in uh, Los Angeles and here in San Diego. He uh, is on a host of uh, different uh, uh, boards and has uh, written extensively as well. He is uh, currently uh, on the uh, postgraduate course in trauma care quality improvement at uh, Harbor He's done that. He has um, written uh, 12 book chapters and director of the Spanish edition of the Emergency Care and Transportation of the Sick and Wounded of the American Academy of uh, Orthopedic Surgeons. Uh, he's now a surgeon in the department uh, at the uh, Hospital Angeles Lomas in Mexico City, vice president of the Pan American Trauma Society in 2011, chairman of the Trauma Systems Committee for the Pan American Trauma Society, uh, 2010 to 2013, co-chair of the Trauma Quality Improvement Subcommittee in the Pan American Trauma Society, editor of Trauma Care Guidelines for Latin America, um, so, Chad, you've got your work cut out for you. Um, so, anyways, without further ado, I'd like to uh, bring Dr. Vega up to discuss sternotomy. Gracias. Para mí ha sido un honor Thank el you. Participar for me, it has been a pleasure to participate in this conference, even uh, from the organization of the conference. I'm going to be talking about sternotomy uh, versus drainage. So I'm going to reveal any conflicts of interest. I really don't have any, but well, I do have one. I'm also in favor of drainage. Can you change the, oh, oh, the slides here in my, on my screen so I can see them on my screen? So, Dr. Chad, I think you and I, we both won. In 1902, Dr. Henry Sherman published a series of 34 cases uh, published on uh, heart surgery from 1896 to 1902. And he was talking about what you see on the screen. The road to the heart is only two or three centimeters long in a direct line, but it has taken surgery nearly 2,400 years to travel it. Uh, why 1896? Um, before this date, uh, cardiac injury patients Almost 100% of them died. Nothing could be done for them until this uh, German surgeon, Dr. Ludwig Wren, was lucky enough to have a patient, patient arrive to him. He was stable with a cardiac injury, and uh, he had a successful surgery. And after that, we started seeing heart, successful heart repair, heart surgery, uh, such that by... 1912 to 1916, mortality had diminished 100%. However, there were people that were not in favor, such as Dr. Bill Roth. Uh, you know about him in his publications and in the forums where he participated. He was very much against any surgical uh, procedure or drainage in the, the pericardium in the heart. He said the paracentesis of the pericardium is a surgery which, in his opinion, was very close to a way of prostitution of the surgical art. That was his opinion. So why are we going back to such ancient times in drainage? 
when after a long time we saw that certain heart uh, injuries, sus suspicious heart injuries in certain areas that I'll show you, if we did the sternotomy, we would be able to reduce mortality considerably. Why go back to such ancient times? It was because of the extension of the non-operating management in transmediastinal areas of the heart. There are many publications as to uh, these areas when they talk about uh, managing them in a non-surgical way. How to reduce morbidity of uh, thoracic surgery it was almost 30 to 35 percent. Management of resources also in high demand places, and this is something that happens a lot <clears throat> in Africa. I'm sure Dr. Ball could talk to us about that. There's also an abuse of costly surgical procedures, such as sternotomy, when there are injuries that we could explore and could have perhaps been treated uh, differently. And um, also because Dr. Ball is a Bill Roth follower ever since then. Well, we must remember that between 1912 and 1914, the survival <clears throat> in cardiac injury went from 0% to 55% survival rate. <clears throat> But in 1934, Dr. Blalock talked a lot about resuscitation, hemorrhagic shock, and Dr. Ravitch. Uh, they both started working on repeated pericardiosynthesis for uh, patients that had heart tapenade, and we saw an increase uh, in mortality. It had diminished from 227% and it grew to 63%. So in 1965, uh, we had a mandatory thoracotomy in penetrating trauma and mortality was uh, reduced <clears throat> to approximately 5%. <clears throat> it's true that uh, pericardium injury to the heart are a dilemma and uh, the general surgeon has to know how to approach through pericardiosynthesis and also the pericardial window, that these are critical skills that all surgeons should dominate. Now, what happens in pericardiosynthesis? Uh, we're going to do a review of 27 articles uh, that fulfilled this criteria, and they tell us that pericardiosynthesis uh, only as a bridge intervention has a survival rate that is quite respectable, uh, such that toracotomy as such doesn't have this survival rate, and this is probably due to the complications and morbidity because of the procedure. It's clear that drainage in this manner can be a temporary relief measure that resolves problems in an immediate fashion before the surgical a procedure. This is an article that was published two years ago from Denver. It's one of the articles that talk about the two options, such as uh, pericardial drainage for penetrating cardiac wounds as a viable option for stabilization. It tells us that it is, as I said, viable. It's a 16-year study. It tells us that it is viable in uh, emergency rooms because it mitigates uh, systemic uh, arrhythmias and ventricular function. The clinical exam has great value. Here's a um, Brazilian study. Uh, it's a retrospective study. It has talks about the enormous weight that's given to uh, arterial pressure when uh, patients initially come in. My question, Dr. Ball, is what do we do with this pa patient? Do we do drainage or do we do sternotomy? This is a young patient. He's stable. He has no tachycardia. And um, the ultrasound shows primo pericardium. We do in a mandatory fashion a sternotomy or a thoracic approach in injuries that include the yellow uh, square that you see on the slide as suspicious of cardiac injury. But not everything is a sternotomy. The uh, 
we have been talked about what should we do with unstable patients or stable patients where uh, sternotomy is advisable, that this um, has not always been that clear. We published many years ago this series where we had 45 patients with cardiac injury. We excluded only those, the fatal ones with toracotomy and res through resuscitation. But when we reviewed the series of patients, so only 2% of patients that survived had a medium sternotomy. The others were 4% in combined patients both the right side and the left side clamp, and 4% of these injuries were done through a left thoracotomy. Thoracotomy. So in these patients that we treated, uh, sometimes with some difficulty because of the av available uh, equipment and the limited time that we have to go into the heart in a sternotomy, this isn't always the best for patients, and some uh, thoracotomy on the left side is an option. In summary, drainage procedures such as the pericardium window and pericardium cardiosynthesis are procedures that every surgeon should know. Um, these are temporary measures that allows us to later on be able to formally explore the patient. It can be done without an OR. Uh, it can allow the patient to remain stable. And ultrasound is an appropriate tool that can guide us when there's no doubt about it. And Dr. Ball is an excellent friend, surgeon, and scientist. Thank you so much. Right. The gauntlet has been launched in the Dr. Ball's direction. So uh, Dr. Ball has been up here, and uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce him formally now. He's a very good friend of mine. Um, did his medical school at the University of Toronto, then went back to went to Calgary, even though he's an Edmonton boy, and went back to Calgary and did his uh, general surgery residency there, and then went on to uh, Grady Memorial at Emory University for his uh, trauma fellowship. And that wasn't enough for him, so he decided to do a hepatobiliary on top of that and then went to Indiana for a HPB fellowship. Uh, he's now an associate professor at the University of Calgary uh, in surgery and in uh, surgical oncology. He's the director of the HPB program as well as the acute care surgery. He's been in practice seven years, and this is kind of an important thing to remember. In those seven years, and some of his residency and fellowship, he already has over 250 publications, 35 book chapters, is an internationally uh, sought after speaker on a multitude of uh, subjects from general surgery, acute care surgery, trauma, hepatobiliary surgery. Um, he really is truly one of our leaders in Canada and it's a great pleasure to have him come up and discuss the drainage alone side of the penetrating cardiac injury in a stable patient. That was a lot of smoke and mirrors. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, maybe two disclosures. The first is that Dr. Vega's reputation and performance is irrepro ir irreproachable. So I'm not going to attack him uh, in any maliceful way. It's, it's, uh, it would be a losing cause. C could we flip the slides to English too? My Spanish is a little rusty. <laughs> oh, just see if I can figure it out. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, exactly, exactly. The, the, my second disclosure is I, I like data, and, and I like common sense and experience, and often those two things go together. Uh, in an ideal world, they go together all, like typically, but, but, but not always, so, so let's walk through this. As you've heard, I've, I've got the drainage-only side of things, and I'm going to talk about, really, really focus on all the level one evidence that answers this question. And guess what that is? That's one randomized control trial. So we'll see what you guys think at the end of it. I want to make it clear out of the gate, we're talking about a very specific, selected subgroup of patients. Don't take this back home or when you're on your travels or wherever that is and say, Ball was up at the podium saying we shouldn't do sternotomies with cardiac injuries because that's not what I'm saying whatsoever. To Dr. Vega's point, we're talking about patients here that in general have a simple, single, box or precordial stab wound. Nothing else is going on. They haven't generally been shot. There's not multiple stab wounds. There's not other injuries. 
Furthermore, and probably most importantly, they're hemodynamically stable. They are rock solid in every part of that definition. And otherwise, like I said, they're otherwise generally well. I think we all know that there's lots of different ways to try and diagnose a, a cardio cardiac injury or a pericardial uh, a clot. Um, physical examination, and I'm hoping Dr. Maddox can get up at the end here and, and repeat some of the stuff that he's told us about this topic before. Beck's triad, pulses paradoxus, um, there's many different physical exam features. Now those tend to be quite late, obviously, and they represent tamponade physiology or approaching tamponade physiology, so not necessarily optimal. You can see subtle changes in a chest x-ray, loss of the AP window, widening of, widening of the heart borders, and so on. The ECG, the Cape Town group in particular, has been very heavy on the concept of J-waves, uh, which are 91% predictive. Again, quite subtle. And I would argue, uh, again, in disagreement with, with some senior iconic uh, uh, folks at my own risk in this room, that the sub xiphoid pericardial window is still a good test. In fact, it's a great test. It tells us whether there's blood in that pericardium or not blood. If you've done a few and you're facile at it, it's quick. You can do it in the ICU, you can do it in the emergency room, you can do it in the operating room, wherever you want. So we, we like it very much uh, in many of the places I've trained and worked. So this is the traditional treatment paradigm. I think we would all agree. It's what we we're all brought up on. It's what we all dogmatically place in our brain in that box uh, and probably don't think about it a lot. So if you're in a scenario, again, in a generally a stab wound, in a stable patient with a sub-pericardial, sub xiphoid pericardial window that's positive, most of those patients should go on to be converted to a median sternotomy. Now, Again, as Dr. Vega talked about, we can debate sternotomies versus thoracotomies or anterolateral thoracotomies with clamshell extensions sort of all day. But again, this is a single stab in the front of the, of the heart, uh, in theory, with a stable patient. So median sternotomy is reasonable. And you find the heart injury, in theory, if it's there. You repair that. You might or might not close the pericardium. To be honest, it depends on where you work. If there's a high risk of that patient coming back for the same scenario, it's really embarrassing to saw through the heart on the second time. So most of us that have trained in those places and work in those places close the pericardium. Then you'll leave a multitude of drains depending on, on what you're comfortable with and what the injury tells you. That could be mediastinal, pericardium, or potentially a chest drain. So here's a couple of bread and butter pictures. There's nothing extravagant. You can see over on the left, there's a pericardial drain sitting there. We're closing the pericardium. The repairs at the bottom of the, of the heart there. Uh, typical pledgeted uh, repair, nothing, nothing exotic. On the far right, there's a mediastinal drain, and that sternum's about to be closed. So this is the paper I was referring to. It comes out of Krutuskir Hospital uh, in Cape Town, South Africa. And I will tell you that Andy Nickel, who's the head of trauma there, is one of the greatest thinkers, I think, currently practicing in the trauma field. And his partner, Pradeep Navsaria, uh, equally so. And these gents put out thought-provoking, uh, very interesting uh, concepts and papers based on massive volumes and pattern recognition. There's no question that practice is different probably than most of us in this room. There's, there, there's no doubt about it. But we can still learn a tremendous amount from, from these individuals. Um, Andy stopped and did a PhD on cardiac injury specifically. And this was really the jewel of his PhD work. So that study looks like this. So all the caveats we just mentioned, sub ziffy window, positive. At that point, patients were randomized to either sternotomy, like we went through, re repair and drain it variably, or just put a pericardial drain in there, follow them for five to seven days was the range. If they were still okay, no blood's coming out of the drain, their ECGs were okay, they clinically were great, pull the drain, send them home. Now that sounds like ludicrous, probably speak initially at the, at the surface of it, but there's two caveats to that. The goal caveat, obviously, is that they're trying to sort out who has a true cardiac injury that needs to be fixed versus a scratch in the heart that really you open up, you look at, and there's not a lot to do. So they're trying to differentiate between non-therapeutic thoracotomies or sternotomies and negative slash um, uh, unhelpful ones. The other thing that mechanically you do is you can create a, a quite a nice access point through that sub ziffy window if you've done them enough. Taking saline and washing that per pericardium out extremely well, even putting a finger or a sponge stick up there to clean it out. At that point, if there's blood that continues to come back, clearly you have a hole. There's an injury there or some sort of issue that you need to fix. So those patients would be converted to sternotomy at that point. So let's go through some of the data in just a sec. 
I put this picture up here. This is Aaron Stein. Uh, he's not super well known in, in, in the US, um, for sure, or really North America as a whole. But he's a very interesting guy. He, he really did, uh, at least in the published literature, come up with a number of concepts um, really before anybody else. Now we, for example, credit selective non-operative management of solid organ injury to, to Shafton and, and to a, a number of other people. Well, he published on that about five years before Shafton uh, uh, did. And, and he's really, really, truly an innovative thinker. There's a beautiful description that, that he wrote uh, where he talks about getting really deeply tired and frustrated with watching the South African sunrise from the operating room at Bergwanath where he ran, for, he ran that unit for almost 20 years uh, while performing non-therapeutic interventions. Now typically those were non-therapeutic laparotomies for sure, but he does talk about non-therapeutic sternotomies and thoracotomies as well. And he looked at that, uh, that whole scenario as a bit of a game. He said, I got outsmarted by the injury. I'm smarter than that. I can differentiate the truth if I think hard enough about it. And so really in that spirit in South Africa, both in uh, uh, Joe Berg as well as, as, uh, as Cape Town, uh, guys like Andy Nickel have tried to push this concept. So let's talk about this, this table first, because I think it's the most, the most important thing you look at anytime you evaluate a trial. So who was excluded in the trial? Really, really important. So obviously 11 patients, and we'll get to the numbers in a sec in, in total, but were excluded because they were under 18 years of age. That's fine. Six patients, as you can see, developed instability during this process, right? So after the clot was washed out, things went sideways, so they were pulled out and sternotomized. The other important number is the second last one, active bleeding during pericardial window, so five patients. So when they got washed out, there was ooze coming out of there, and so they got a sternotomy. So the total number of patients that were excluded based on this table here is 80. This is the, the, the flow diagram as, as you would expect. So if we start at the top, you can see 191 patients were evaluated initially as possible candidates. We lost those 80, so we're down to 111. This trial was powered for 50 people in each arm. It was adequately trialed. As you can see, it was almost perfectly matched. 55 in the sternotomy arm, 56 in the pericardial drainage arm. Now there's no question follow-up, particularly in penetrating trauma patients, is a big problem. At Huchiskir Hospital, they have a, a really quite an impressive uh, mechanistic way of chasing these patients. But having said that, still nine out of 56 patients, or about 17%, if you do the math, were lost to follow up in the pericardial drainage group. You can see on the other hand, 28 out of 55, so a lot higher were lost in the sternotomy group. And that's the reality of these studies in these environments. Let's look a little bit deeper at these patients then and ask ourselves, can we apply this patient population to our practices where we work? So as Dr. Feliciano uh, commonly uses the term and did yesterday, these are young gunfighters. You can see they're in their, their latter 20s. Really the, the demographics of each group, whether it was sternotomy or drainage, were matched quite well. The other point is, is the last one here, the mechanism. Again, these are almost exclusively single stab wounds from the anterior approach into the heart and theory or into the box. There was only one gunshot uh, wound to the box in either group. Uh, those are, are very low caliber, basically 22 uh, uh, weapons, uh, almost handmade bullets in South Africa. So certainly not what you would see in, in urban America or urban uh, a lot of places. Let's look at the injuries itself, particularly obviously in the sternotomy group. So what did they find when they sternotomized those 56 patients? Well the first one in terms of a grade one injury, which is a penetrating pericardial wound without cardiac injury. You can see 24, so basically a quarter, 24% uh, of those patients had no cardiac injury. In other words, there was blood in the pericardium from something else. They had torn their pericardium, uh, venous hemorrhage, whatever. There was actually no cardiac injury. The most important line is the next one in my mind, which is that 69% of patients in that sternotomy group had penetrating tangential myocardial wounds that didn't extend to the endocardium. So those are wounds that you're looking at and you're thinking, well, it's clearly the source of the problem and the source of the blood. It's kind of a scratch. We're not gonna take out 7-0 and try and sew this. Probably just best left alone. That's a non-therapeutic intervention, assuming that the physiology of this patient, these patients are stable, like I've told you. And then you move down that, that list as well. 
Another important table, obviously, is how these patients did. <clears throat> so as most proper current studies should, use, should, uh, should um, employ, we use the Clavian uh, uh, complication uh, categorization. So grade one, which is really just atelectasis, well, of course, they're going to be higher in the operative intervention group like sternotomy. I don't really think that's a big deal. Pneumonia complications are grade two in this scenario. Uh, we're about even. If you skip down to the bottom, though, you can see there was only one death out of these 111 patients, uh, and that was in the sternotomy group. It's an interesting story, but the arrest and the, and the, uh, and the, sterno and the, um, the death were clearly related to that intervention. Um, so in general, drainage patients in this highly selected subgroup, as we mentioned, uh, did quite well. The conclusion in that paper is this, and I want to take just 15 seconds to read it to you, because I think it's important. In summary, pericardial drainage alone appears effective and safe in the management of hemopericardium in the stable patient, stable patient after penetrating chest trauma, with no increase in mortality and a shorter ICU and hospital stay. Well, the latter part makes sense, of course, if we're not doing a sternotomy, they'd probably be home, home quicker. This policy should be adopted only in trauma centers with significant experience in the management of cardiac injuries and with immediate availability of an operating room. That last sentence, that caveat, is really important, right? If we're not comfortable doing this, probably given the medical legal environment in some of our countries, it's probably better to do the sternotomy and be sure and accept the risk, the potential higher, more, certainly the higher morbidity and potentially higher mortality of that intervention. Um, but it is interesting. There's no question that this manuscript of Andy's generated a ton of response. Uh, a lot of it, you know, was very, very, very favorable. People really enjoyed it, but a lot of it was, was aggressively negative as well. This is just one of the responses to the, to the letters to the editors that, that we wrote. And I put it up here because there's an important figure in it, which is to keep in mind that the median time to presentation, so from stab wound to showing up that hospital, was two days. The range was one to six. These patients come in, they get stabbed, they come in from the, the townships, which are sort of like shanty towns. It takes them a long time to get in. So they've already had a trial of life. And that's where this question is important. This isn't the acute guy that's been stabbed in the heart because a deal has gone south on him an hour and a half ago, six blocks downtown. This is a different patient population. And this is the, the scenario for sure where, where this technique saves morbidity and, and, and certainly mortality as well. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Okay, do we have any uh, questions from the audience? Dr. Maddox. Ken Maddox from Houston. The debate is provocative, and you described a different kind of patient than we see in urban America with gunshot wounds where all are unstable. You've defined, un you've defined stable patients, often who are two, three, and four days out. My question to both debaters is, this is an international audience often with great distances, with great time interval, and with uh, urban and even uh, wilderness areas. We do have cell phones and communication. What advice do we give to the world in the stable patient who has no means of transport to a trauma center in an urban area, who remains stable, and does not change, and they're two days out, but they want advice on what to do, and they only have rudimentary surgery skills. Uh, um, creo que, uh, I believe que doctor, pero... that the person has to go see a doctor. <laughs> but I think that the aspect having to do with communication presently, especially with all the technology that we have nowadays, is to see how urban centers can communicate to these other people through internet so that we can offer perhaps a remote uh, a consultation or recommend or 
make arrangements for the patients' transfers, see what we can do. There are some centers in Miami that are doing <clears throat> remote uh, consultation uh, through video cameras in remote sites as to how certain procedures should be done and training even in these procedures. So I think we can do remote uh, I, I agree. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, yeah, that, I mean, that's the, that's the bread and butter uh, 30,000 foot view public health type question. And, and of course, it's a great one. Uh, you know, our, our geographic problems in Canada are significant, uh, as you can imagine, with, with 35 million people in, a, in an area that size. So it's not infrequent that, that we see patients with a whole host of different acute problems that have really undergone a trial of life. And, and that's an, a bit of an aggressive term, but I think it's also accurate. Um, you know, in Canada, we would say, that's a big problem. You should get that patient here, fly them, drive them, do whatever, with the expectation that they're probably going to be just fine when they hit your doors six, eight, 18 hours later. Um, I, I, I don't know what you do if you truly believe that patient needs an intervention in a remote site um, in, the, in the context of you know, surgical skills that are not um, what yours are or what you, what you would optimally want. Um, last month I was in Australia at their college meeting and, and their telehealth, to your point, is unbelievably advanced and they're using uh, telehealth um, to really guide a number of complex procedures through basic, uh, almost primary caregivers in very remote environments to great success and they've been doing that for three years. So there is a technology um, uh, link there and there is a, there is a future to that. Uh, but in 2016, it would so depend on where you were, and, and, and it would be a challenge. There's no doubt. Dr. Feliciano. Good morning, everybody. I, I take a certain pride as uh, Dr. Perry and Dr. Ball were both fellows with us at Grady. You're doing great. One of the interesting things to me is we started ultrasound for cardiac injuries in 1994 at Grady when Dr. Rosicki came and we automatically went to surgery if we had a hemopericardium. And I'm trying to remember how many cases we found where we didn't have to do anything to the heart. Because you're describing in the South African series tangential injuries, and I'm sure they occur. But I'm trying to think in my long experience in this field, how many times I've opened a pericardium and not put a stitch in. I don't know whether it's the the heavy uh, percentage of stab wounds versus gunshot wounds. But when th this paper first came out, I was very concerned because I just couldn't recall at our m and report, oh, this was a non-therapeutic sternotomy. So I keep wondering if there is some skewing of the data here. And I'm, oh, I'd really be curious what other American trauma centers have found. I cannot remember ever doing personally a sternotomy where I didn't put a stitch in the heart. Yeah, I, I mean, that's the elephant in the room, and it's why you, we have to apply all of these studies, regardless of their methodologic quality, in a very careful way to, to where you practice and what that means. Um, you know, you're right. Typically in urban America, it's going to be, or urban Calgary, uh, where we don't have many gunfighters, and despite the Calgary Stampede going on right now, it's, it's more knife fighters, but those are bigger, heavier knives with, with real injuries, for sure. Um, I don't know that this is common outside of a couple of places in the world where they see such incredible volume. It, everything seems common. Uh, but it's something to keep in mind uh, for sure. Thank you. And I do remember as a, as a fellow talking to you about the study as we were setting it up over there. And I still remember your look. <laughs> <laughs> La mirada que usted me dio todavía. I believe that's, that it is important for us to mention that I'm quite sure that any of us have seen stable patients that have single injuries to the thorax in the area known as uh, suggestive of heart injuries or cardiac injury. In my experience, I have seen that a patient is apparently stable and all of a sudden they collapse. Um, this, I believe, would be the group of patients that we have to have in mind. 
we need to immediately know what to do when that happens. And for this uh, toracotomy uh, to resuscitate them in hostile environments, even if we have uh, people that are prepared for this, it still represents a challenge, a dilemma. Uh, for very remote areas where there are still uh, failures in uh, diagnostics and failures in being able to identify uh, injuries in the thoracic box that are suggestive of cardiac injury. I think that with the present technology that we have, as Dr. Maddox asked, having someone close or having that connection to centralized uh, hospitals or centers through WhatsApp or, I don't know, email, even conventional email, it can represent a tremendous uh, help. Uh, but there are many remote sites in Latin America where we don't have material, we don't have resources, we don't have training, and we don't have access. So we have to train better as to when they have to suspect these uh, cardiac injuries, when they have to seek consultation and not delay transportation as soon as possible. Excellent. Any uh, further, further? Oh, we have a question. It's a, it's a question uh, from, uh, uh, from um, Dr. Castillo in, in, in Leon, Guanajuato. Uh, is this an, uh, any amount of, uh, of hemipericardial uh, amount of fluid that in, um, indicates uh, surgery uh, uh, instead of uh, in an hemodynamically stable patient and uh, how much you can follow up, how, how many days? For, uh, for a surgery. Yeah, I mean, that, that trial was predicated on, uh, not on the amount of hemopericardium, uh, quite honestly, it was predicated on whether that uh, hemopericardium continued or not, i.e., was there oozing or bleeding after you washed it out effectively. Um, so, there, you know, we all know, I think, that the, the larger the hemopericardium, the greater the chance of, of marching towards tamponade physiology and clinically manifesting that. Um, so th these are not huge hemopericardiums in general, but it's really the, the continuation or not uh, of proceeding. Uh, you know, the, the trial, uh, the observation period was five to seven days, and it varied a fair bit within that range, but still reasonably tight. Could you do it for two days and send them home? P probably. Um, you know, there's risk to everything that you do. Uh, there's cost to everything that we do, but it's somewhere in that range, at least based on the trial. Yeah. Do you, th you think you repeat the ultrasound for the next two days? I think that wraps it up for questions, so uh, please, another round of applause to Drs. Ball and Dr. Vega.